Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Ben and you're watching Expressive Photography. In this week's video, I'm gonna dive into my Lightroom catalog to revisit a day uh, back on the 12th of February, which was actually the last time that I was out with my camera. Since then, my camera sat in its bag uh, in a corner and I've only taken it out once, which was to film a rather demented chaffinch that was flying into our window for three days. Uh, so yeah, the 12th of February was the last time that I was physically out in the landscape with my camera. Part of the reason for that was I spent so much time having to record the processing videos for my new Dodge and Burn Masterclass. And I'm actually gonna be touching on some of that content today as I revisit this frozen river which was absolutely stunning. We had such a beautiful time exploring an area we'd never been to before and found this beautiful little uh, cascade with all this ice forming these amazing formations. Um, and I want to come in and just show you how I'm going to approach this. I've got no idea what I'm going to do. I've got no planned shots in mind. I haven't looked at the photographs since I took them. So this is literally we're going to dive into Lightroom now, we're going to look at the images, we're going to select the ones that I think might work as photographs, we're going to process them in Lightroom and hopefully end up with a little selection that somehow represent the day or the experience or how I feel about them now. So uh, join me on this somewhat uh, panic-stricken voyage into the unknown where I've literally got no idea what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do, or how I'm going to process. So this, uh, this is either going to be brilliance or a disaster. So here we are in Lightroom and I took a total of 19 frames in the time that I was there. And if we just go to the very, very first one, this was the, the main part of the scene, I guess, was these beautiful like icicles that were forming around the edge of the river here and then the stream had frozen partially and it's it was just amazing it was so beautiful as soon as i have flowing water in the frame the first thing that is key is the shutter speed is finding the shutter speed and because there's no go to number you have to just look at the aesthetics it was way harder when we we're shooting film because you have to kind of guesstimate or bracket shutter speeds. So in this particular shot here, let's have a, a quick look. And I, I started at an eighth of a second and I quite like the detail that I have in the top of the cascade here. And in the back there, it's not too blurry. There's still enough texture and detail. So I'm, I'm actually quite happy with that. But I then did a third of a second just to see the impact of that. And I think it was quite good down at the bottom there. And then I did a half a second. And then I kind of stuck in the half a second for a while. So I think at the time in the field, I sort of decided that half a second was aesthetically where I wanted to be. Of course, now I look at them on the computer you get to you get to kind of examine them far closer than you would in the field and uh i can see why i went for that but for this particular shot i think i actually quite like the third of a second which is the middle exposure in terms of the composition i'm quite happy with it i i don't struggle in the field to find compositions exactly because I'm not looking for a composition. My approach in the landscape has always been to just notice things that I think already look good together and then just decide where the frame edges need to be because anything above that was obviously distracting. Everything below the bottom of the frame I obviously felt was distracting. So I've, I've used my uh, 2470 Nikon f2.8 lens here and I've, this is at 58 millimeters at f16, which is giving me enough depth of field to make sure everything is sharp in the frame. So I'm gonna mark this one as a five, just because it's gonna be easier to find the ones that we want to process. 
So that's the first scene really. And there was a few little subtle changes of composition. Um, and I did do a little bit more shutter speed choices and ended up that final one was a fifth of a second. But yeah, I'm happy with the one I chose. Of course, back in February, I was still very much in favor of shooting four by fives and squares and 16 by nines. That was where I was at that time. I've kind of decided the next time I go out with my camera, I'm probably going to shoot more full frame uh, because I want to explore that format, which I haven't done for such a long time. Unless I'm shooting verticals, I can't shoot three to two verticals. Um, something horrible will happen. Three to two verticals are my kryptonite, so I, I, I can't do that. The square composition I, I like. I think it's very compact and I, I'm very happy with the way the content sits in the frame. And again, I did bits of experimentation with the shutter speed from a slower shutter speed of half a second and the fifth of a second I still quite like. I'm not going to process this one because it's, it's superficially quite similar to the, to the vertical composition. A little bit of rearranging here and I had really plumped for a fifth of a second, but I don't think they're telling me anything new about this scene particularly. Uh, so I still think that overall version there, yeah, this is where the great indecision comes in. I quite like this one actually. So yeah, this the square I think is really quite concise. So again, I've graded that one. Uh, there were another couple of different compositions that I tried. The main notice here is I went into the 16 by 9 format and I really like this. I think that works particularly well. And what we'll do once we've decided on the photos that we're going to look at in more detail, I'll explain why I have chosen these ones, what each of them is saying to me and why they're asking me to process them. Um, and that, that's going to be a very interesting, uh, he says, <laughs> advertising his own worth. Uh, it should be quite interesting to look at the different consequences and emotional feel of each of these because we've got a 4 by 5 vertical, a square and now a 16 by 9 The final scene that I found I really liked actually, there was just this window down uh, onto the river with this nicely shaped ice round about it and I, I was very keen on this and I took quite a few. The, the, the horizontal again has a very different emotional feel but it's a bit tight I think and I think I ended up plumping for one of those two. That's a quarter of a second and that's a half a second. And I'm just skipping in between and it's, it's almost like when you go to the optician and they put that thing in front of your eye and you've got to say A or B, A or B. This is really what I'm doing and it's just trying to trust my gut. I'm going to go with this one because I like the luminosity underneath the ice better in this one. You can see this one's a bit flatter, a little bit less contrast. The, the ice in the rim here I think is looking at its finest. So I'm going to choose those go back to that view and then I'm going to come in and choose the rated ones. So that's me got the four images that we've looked at. So there's really only one scene shot three different ways and then a different scene which has got a different feel to it. Uh, these two, these three are actually superficially quite similar in that the, the contrast and the, 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 the content within the frame is similar. If I want these to feel harmonious and work together, I don't want to work them as individual files. I want to make some global changes so they feel the same uh, in terms of their overall uh, tonality, contrast, luminosity, temperature and tint, th those, those elements are going to determine how these images feel. Um, and in fact, all four of them, I think, can have that continuity of tone. And then I can make individual local adjustments with each of them to make each of them look their best uh, because they have different tonal relationships within the context of the frame. So I'll select them all 
and go into the develop module and um, turn on auto sync and now everything I do to one frame will be mirrored across all four frames. I'm just going to tidy up my, um, I'll do lens corrections here because I'm using a 24mm lens and there's a little bit of distortion. It's not a button that I I tick automatically on import. It's not a preset that I, I don't do any presetting on import um, because I want to make that choice of whether it's going to be distorted or not. But one thing I will tidy up here is I'm just going to sort out my black point globally just to try and get rid of any clipping and that one will need sorted out. There, there's a slight difference here across the frames but generally I'll do this one first and then I can make micro adjustments. So overall I'm kind of happy with that. I can increase the whites to bring in a bit of luminosity. Ice, I think I've talked about in the past, we've just come out of the winter, I was shooting lots of snow and ice, and one of the key components of shooting ice is to make it feel that beautiful translucence that we experience when we're out there in the field. It glows, it, it shines, um, even on a flat overcast day, the ice is always going to be the most joyous thing because light gets into it and bounces around and gets refracted. <laughs> refracted and reflected. Uh, so bringing out the joy of ice, I think, is a very important thing. Most of that I will do locally, however. The next overall adjustment I think I'm going to make is the images were darkish, but I'm going to just darken them a fraction more so that I can introduce more of that ice luminosity. And then the next thing I'm going to do is check my temperature. I always think ice should feel cold because if it gets too warm, it, it doesn't feel cold <laughs> anymore. So I think this is one of the natures of expressive photography is allowing each element to feel like it, like it should. Um, there's a wonderful word called onomatopoeia, which which is basically saying something sounds it, it it's written like it sounds like cuckoo, uh, or plop or splash. Some of those words sound like they they, they feel, um, and I think ice should feel cool. So yeah, that's important to me. There's some really interesting colors up in this stuff. This is where the soil I think is leached down underneath the ice but there's some gorgeous tonality up there so I'm kind of happy about that. So overall that is probably all I'm going to do with these photographs. I might give them a little bit of a boost. The water has a certain touch of coolness to it. This is heavily oxygenated highland spring water basically and there can be a blueness in it which is some of the mineral content but that's helped to bring out some of that gorgeous warm tones at the top of the frame. Uh, I wish there was more of that. It's it's really delicious. So I'm going to uncheck auto sync. And now if I scroll through the images, we can see that they all, well, if I turn on the G key, they look superficially similar in that tonally they have a, a kind of similar feel. Some of these images I don't think are going to need a huge amount of processing. But one of the things I do want to do is just increase that feeling of proximity in the foreground. Dodging and burning is not just lightening and darkening. Now, this is something I explore hugely in my new Dodge and Burn Masterclass, which came out last week. Uh, thank you very much for anyone who's purchased it so far. I hope you're enjoying it. The feedback so far has been amazing. Thank you very much. Dodging and burning, you can dodge and burn with more than just bright bright and dark. We, we don't just have to lighten and darken. We can dodge and burn with texture. We can dodge and burn with temperature and tint. We can dodge and burn with atmosphere. We can do all sorts of amazing adjustments these days. And the only purpose of dodging and burning is to enhance and to make the thing feel more like itself so I want to make this ice feel more like ice. So how can I do that? 
I can introduce some more luminosity to it. But I also, because it's at the front of the frame here, I want to increase the detail and clarity. And now I have, if I just turn that layer off, I'll turn off the auto mask because that's a bit funky. I now have an adjustment there that has brought that whole foreground to life. And it suddenly feels close, it suddenly feels more luminous, it suddenly feels more icy, it suddenly feels more um, close and just like you could reach out and touch it. The top of the frame actually may benefit from the same adjustment just because it's such a wonderful bit of the frame. Now, theoretically, because it's further away, it shouldn't feel as close, but I think it's now we're creating a kind of sandwich of luminosity, which I really like. It's creating a, a platform for the rest of the frame to, to kind of move through. And I think I'm also going to just paint in that bit of the waterfall there, just to bring a little bit of extra joyfulness. So this dodging and burning is really quite, quite simple. I'm just going to increase my shadows a fraction and my blacks and just come through here. I don't want that area at the back to get too dark. It's very easy with shots like this for it to get really crunched in there. So very quickly, if I just turn the lights off, we're getting to a stage with this frame where it's feeling great. We don't have to over process these. We don't have any light to worry about. We don't have any directionality of light to worry about. Processing doesn't have to be complicated. It just needs to be effective. Um, and I hope when, when I'm demonstrating this technique, we can see how quickly you can make photographs expressive and articulate without over processing them. I am going to, I, I don't go into Photoshop unless I have to. Um, and this shot I don't believe needs to go into Photoshop. Um, and I do go into Photoshop a lot in the Dodge and Burn series. In the second half, there's a few hours of Photoshop where I'm using luminosity masks and the history brush and the LAB color space. But for the benefit of this, uh, this photograph in the channel here, I'm happy just to stay in Lightroom. If you don't know how to make your photographs look good in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, going into Photoshop really isn't going to help too much. There's a few little bits like these little slices of dark there, this little spot here and this, I am I probably would go into Photoshop and do a bit of slight warping just to kind of tidy up that content. And I'll do that uh, before I finish the photograph. And when you look at the slideshow at the end, we will see the final versions of these shots. Now, the second shot here is going to have quite similar um, attributes to the first, uh, but obviously I need to do those adjustments again because we can't, you can't bring brushes forward from one image to another um, because the content is in a different place. So again, I'm just going to quickly come in and sort out my blacks. And I'm going to make this one with a slightly different feel. Um, that spot needs to move again. But this has got quite a simple feel to it. I'm going to just slightly enhance the saturation through that section there. There's a little bit of greeny color. We've lost quite a lot of the warmer tones in this frame because they've been cropped out. But what I can do is just increase the saturation of what is there, just to add a little bit of difference. With ice shots, they, they all get a bit monochromatic. So the fact that there is color dusted around these frames kind of makes them look like it's, it's going to help uh, to, to make them feel a bit better. So I'm just going to really give that ice a boost. And then I think I'm going to come in with another separate adjustment to just come into there. I think this area in this shot, because it's a square composition, I'm 
the foreground feels more significant. It's taking up more real estate in the frame than this version. We've got the top that helps to balance this image. This one, the foreground is more important and I think it's, it, it's even more important to make it, and we can make that quite significantly brighter. So I'm kind of happy with that. This horizontal version is really quite different though, but again, I think we need to make that same adjustment because it's all about the foreground and it's all about um, making that feel. Yeah, we can live with this. And really I'm just making a sandwich of the river with all of this content that can come out again. So we've got three shots now, which superficially are of the same thing, but they all feel slightly different. Um, and we'll now come into this final one. This is quite a different shot. It's got a very different feel to it, but I think we're gonna find, we're gonna end up doing quite similar adjustments. This one's a fraction darker. So I'm just gonna brighten that one up. I think it got really overcast when I was uh, shooting this one. I need to open up my blacks in there. And then with a second adjustment brush. If you have a foreground that feels like it should be closer than other parts of the frame, it's important for it to feel that way. This content, this ice acting as a, a frame for the river is important. Now, what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm actually going to, oops, I don't know why that's happening. There we go. I'm actually gonna remove a little bit of clarity from the river and open up my shadows and I'm gonna give that a bit of saturation. That nice red rock under the surface here feels kinda of nice. And give it some brightness too. And that feels fine. And overall, I just take a bit of global contrast off. Once you've made local adjustments, an awful lot of local adjustments are to create a feeling that each bit of the frame is, is different from another bit of the frame. So the foreground is different from the left-hand side, it's different from the back, it's different from the river. We're kind of creating zones within the frame so that each element within the, the square in this case can kind of exist in its own space and feel the way we want it to feel. Um, once we've made that so it feels as if it belongs together, because this is the key, we're throwing all this content into a frame with, it, with, its, with other bits, um, but it needs to feel as if it's a whole. This bright patch here would definitely be something that I would want to tone down because see how it catches the eye on that edge. So you want to take the luminosity out of that and make it less standing out. Uh, it's so important to, to understand those little bright bits on the edges of frames can be really demanding on the eye. So I think when I make local adjustments, the idea is to make each bit feel as if it belongs with the other bits. Um, and then once we've got that, we can kind of re-establish a global feel where it's like, okay, I've taken a bit of global clarity off. Because you can add in a bunch of stuff and then take it away. Just because you add something doesn't mean it has to stay added. We can always, in Lightroom, we can undo things that we've done. We can either dial back a brush, we can dial back global adjustments, we can increase contrast, we can tone our, we can change our mind about the tonality of the photographs, all that type of stuff. So none, none of this stuff is committing. And I think that's one of the really important learning points 
and again, I talk about this a lot in the video series, is that this is a no-risk environment and you need to explore the boundaries of reality and then understand how your unique perception can be incorporated into that vision. So hopefully um, these four images are now singing the praises of this little frozen river. I've kind of enjoyed this. Uh, it was a really fascinating scene. Um, whether I ever chose to share those photographs or not is kind of immaterial. When I do these videos, you're kind of bearing your soul. I mean, you're having to sort of expose, it's, it's almost like exposing yourself in public. It's, it's quite a distressing feeling sometimes. But at the end of the day, I think it's important for us to have a relationship with our photography that's not very judgmental. It's not about making photographs, it's about having experiences in the landscape and then trying to use our skill and creative vision to come up with photographs that we find pleasing to the eye. Um, so I've just looked at this one. It's really, when you're looking at thumbnails, it can be very useful to see things that you don't see when you're in big. So on that left side now, I'm toning that down a bit because it's too bright. And the right hand side can be enhanced a little and that's gonna to help to pull the eye over to that side. So again, dodging and burning is a way of uh, creating a, um, a luminosity trail, I suppose. So what I'll do, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, tidying up these photographs and at the end of the video, we'll put together a little slideshow with some music and we'll be able to see them kind of finished. Uh, I'm not gonna do tons and tons of work, but there are going to be some fine details that need to be sorted out. Um, if you want to explore the inside of my brain uh, and my increasingly opinionated stance on contemporary landscape photography, please consider subscribing to the members channel. The upper tier expressive photographers, uh, for a start, you get a 25% discount on all future expressive photography video and ebook releases. Um, if you sign up in the next week or two, I will make that discount available to you. Uh, so if you haven't bought the video series yet and you would like to save uh, quite a substantial saving because it's not cheap, 25% uh, discount if you join the members channel. Uh, and on there every week I'm posting much more in-depth videos and tend to show more sophisticated techniques beyond the more basic stuff and talking about the business, talking about developing ourselves as artists, talking about the true power of landscape photography to our self-development and how to basically be a happier and more productive photographer. Um, that's it for this week. Next week, I'm going to be bringing you on Sunday a Vision and Light episode uh, featuring Eric Bennett. Uh, in April, I have a couple of very long weekend conferences um, and I need to dial back on the content for a little while. So for a couple of weeks, I'm going to be bringing you Vision and Light episodes. So Eric Bennett is going to be up for the next two Sundays. Uh, Eric is an amazing photographer from the West Coast of the US, really making a name for himself. He has a new book out or coming out um, and I'm really excited to be talking to Eric. Uh, so hopefully you will find that of great value and then I'll be back along with some more West of Scotland vlogs. Our whole lockdown situation is easing in April and into May so it's going to be allowed to get out and about in the landscape an awful lot more. Maybe do a little bit more traveling in Scotland to go to some areas away from the birch forests around our home. So yeah, stick with us. If you enjoy this content, give us the old thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends, send out newsletters and put it in the local newspaper that expressive photography is the place to be watching. Um, I'm getting my COVID vaccine tomorrow morning, which I'm very excited about. Um, and hopefully things are going to start easing off in Scotland and we can get out and about a little bit more frequently. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. That's enough for this week. Be safe wherever you are and I hope you enjoy the Dodging and Burning Masterclass available in the link below. Bye for now. <laughs>